The grounds that we reside on now are very historic grounds. Any black person prior to the Civil War was caught reading or writing. They were whipped or beaten. Ignorance was the order of the day. There was no such thing as a Negro school in the South. From those early beginnings in Reconstruction, blacks in Texas, like the blacks elsewhere in the South, knew how important education was. I think they were much more concerned and much more dedicated in pursuit of higher learning than the majority of white Texans at that time were. Prairie View is a survivor. Even in the worst of times, there were students who went to that institution, slogged through the mud, went to classes with no books and no seats and no equipment, and came out of there and could compete with other people in their fields. That's a treasure for us and for this state, and we should never lose sight of it. I can walk around with my backpack and read a book under some trees that some people were killed under for reading. What's a greater payback? You know, where individuals of all races sit there and they study together, where at one time it was unheard of. We should all be proud of the fact that a little land-grant college down there that probably at one time had four or 500 kids, you know, has now grown to be a major contributor in this society. Forty-five minutes northwest of Houston, Prairie View A&M University sits nestled amidst historic landmark buildings and arching live oaks. With its beginnings in 1876, Prairie View A&M has persevered despite all odds. Forgotten by many historical timelines, the university's present-day setting stands as a benign testament to more turbulent times. Homecoming, a college tradition. And this scene, repeated countless times each fall on college campuses throughout the country, had great significance at Prairie View A&M as the school celebrated its 125th anniversary. Prairie View A&M University is the second oldest public institution of higher learning in Texas, and it almost didn't survive. The college was founded to educate blacks in the post-Civil War era. Racial mistreatment and a constant shortage of funding were just two of the challenges students and faculty faced. Today, it is one of America's largest and most influential historically black colleges and universities, or HBCUs. The university consistently produces some of the nation's top engineers, nurses, teachers, architects, business, and military leaders. Prairie View A&M University stands as a reminder of struggle. Prairie View was created uh, out of exclusion, uh, exclusion because it was created to educate people that uh, others did not want. In the mid-1800s, the land that Prairie View A&M now occupies in Waller County, Texas, was known as Alta Vista Plantation, a cotton plantation tended by slaves. As the United States began to expand westward, the nation began to struggle with the issue of slavery. Anti-slavery forces in the North wanted slavery abolished. At the same time, white Southern plantation owners, whose livelihoods depended on the institution of slavery, sought to continue their way of life. Southerners, attracted to Texas, began to migrate to the frontier state they sought out new farming opportunities, bringing their slaves with them. In 1861, the conflict over slavery ultimately led to the Civil War. Four years and 617,000 lives later, slavery was finally abolished on January 31st, 1865, when Congress approved the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution. 
The political climate in Texas after the Civil War was very frightening, I would say very unstable. It was frightening for both white Southerners and black Southerners. In a seemingly unconscionable effort by plantation owners to ignore the law, Texas slaves were not made aware of their freedom until two and a half years after Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. General Gordon Granger landed at Galveston Island with the Union soldiers, and he read the Emancipation Proclamation saying that all those slaves held in those states uh, in rebellion are now free. The word was received there at Galveston on June the 19th, and even today, African Americans celebrate Juneteenth. And an ironic historical twist. The last articles of the Confederacy telling soldiers in Texas to lay down their arms were signed at Alta Vista Plantation, future home of Prairie View A&M University. It was here that they penned the orders dismissing the Confederate troops in Texas. So the last orders of the Confederate Army were written here at Prairie View. Prior to the Civil War, it was illegal in the South to teach slaves to read or write. It quickly became apparent that slaves were not guaranteed social, political, or economic equality. They would need an education to become contributors to society and to overcome the illiteracy and poverty that came as a result of years of servitude. The idea became how do we now raise these ignorant slaves that couldn't read and write up to be wage earners? Prairie View A&M's epic journey began when the federal government enacted the Land Grant College Act of 1862, also called the Morrill Act. The Texas Constitution of 1876 then established the Agricultural and Mechanical College of Texas, later to become Texas A&M University. But the school would only admit white students. Lincoln saw the need for the creation in this country of a middle-class set of people to make the democracy work. So he created what he called a land-grant college, but some people refer to it as a poor man's college. And in order for Texas to qualify for that as one of the new states back in the Union, they had to establish a land-grant school, which became A&M. But because they had been one of the states defined as in rebellion, they had to provide separate or equal or included facilities for the newly freed slaves. The southern states said that they didn't want to go to school with Negroes, so they, they petitioned the federal government to let them establish two universities. And they were supposed to have been separate but equal. So they allowed them to create a &M College, which was for white males only, and it remained from white males from 1876 up to 1963. And they created Prairie View for black males. Having one college for black and white students under that land grant provision in Texas would never have been accepted by whites. Under pressure from the federal government, Texas legislators pledged that separate schools shall be provided for the white and colored children, and impartial provisions shall be made for both. The legislators realized that they had to establish a school for blacks. On August 14, 1876, the Texas legislature established a second land-grant college, the Agricultural and Mechanical College of Texas for Colored Youths. The board of directors of A&M College at Bryan, 50 miles away, was given responsibility for management of this new school for blacks. The site selected for the school was the former slave plantation, Alta Vista, near the town of Hempstead. The A&M College of Texas for Colored Youths opened on March 11, 1878, with eight young black men enrolled for the first class. Tuition was $130 for nine months, and included instruction, room and board, and one uniform. Whoever was appointed president of Texas A&M was always the president of Prairie Review, and a principal was here to oversee the day-to-day -day activities. Again, in the South, there was a mentality that still had a hard time believing that, that African Americans were even human. The school wasn't permitted to have a president. So a principal teacher was put in charge of all campus activities. L.W. Minor, 
an educator from Mississippi, was selected by the board to be the first principal of the little school at Prairie View. The education of blacks, of former slaves, was something I think that they more than the white Texans knew they needed, and they were much more enthusiastic than most about education in general. The president of the Texas A&M board recommended that Prairie View focus on manual labor, farm work for the male students, and cooking for the female students. They had broom making classes, they had wood cabinet making, they had ag class. The Agricultural and Mechanical College of Texas for Colored Youths had been created to conform to the law of the land, which mandated its existence. But in the beginning, little was expected of it. The mere fact that the Texas legislature elected to create Prairie View, you'd have to say it was good. <laughs> the fact that they uh, gave a grant of $5,000 for creation Prairie View would maybe say not so, so good. So it started off not in a hole, it started off in a well as far as financial resources. During the 1870s, the United States was in a period of unprecedented growth. The year that Prairie View A&M was established, Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone. Even though eastern states were becoming industrialized, the Texas economy still revolved mostly around cotton farming. Texas was, in terms of population centers, hugely rural. Maybe 90% of the people in Texas or more lived in places that were farm communities, towns under 2,000 people. Galveston was the biggest town in Texas. It had 13,000, though. Uh, and the next was uh, San Antonio, which had 12,000. Houston um, had something like 9,000 people in 1870. In 1878, Thomas Edison established the Edison Electric Light Company in New York City. And in Texas, on the isolated and sweeping plains of the former Alta Vista Plantation, the struggling young school was in session for the first time. The epic journey was underway. The young men that came here on March 11th, 1878, didn't finish the whole year. When they came back in the fall, fall time was also the cotton picking season. So those young men had to go home and help their families with the cotton pick. It led one of the board members over at a and to make the comment, you see, the Negroes are not ready for higher education. So we need to lease the place out. But the students did return to continue their education. When the next semester began in 1879, the school opened with a new name, Prairie View Normal and Industrial College. The school boasted a faculty of three, teaching 13 subjects. Fifteen students were in that second class, both male and female, making Prairie View A&M the first state-supported co-ed college in Texas. However, funding for the school was scarce. Around the early 1880s, uh, the state decided uh, not to audit the books of Prairie View because they said that because the name had been changing so much that Prairie View was not that institution uh, spoken of uh, for African Americans in the state's constitution. So they refused to pay the, the salaries and bills. So for a while there, uh, nobody got paid. There was no food. Uh, the local farmers uh, had to uh, bring corn and chickens and stuff over to feed the children. Uh, the governor imposed upon a rich white fellow out of Houston to come out and advance some money so that they could feed them. We're talking about post-Civil War Texas. We're talking about a separate and absolutely unequal uh, situation. As a matter of fact, people considered Prairie View as those folks over there, and whatever they got was good enough. Prairie View's curriculum in its early years went from mostly vocational courses to seven academic departments, including English, mathematics, education, natural science, home arts, mechanical arts, and agriculture. Male students were also taught carpentry and elementary mechanics. The early students, while some of them may have been more advanced than others, on, by and large, they had to struggle through a lot of these courses. And we find that they had to teach a lot of things, not just reading and writing, but how to take care of yourself, how to, how to eat, how to care for your family, how to clean, how to do different things, just basic stuff. Because after slavery, slaves were just turned loose. Even though Prairie View was starting to grow, its management and more importantly, its funding remained under the administration of Texas A&M. Even from the beginning, there was not even a presentation or effort to make it 
comparable or equal. So Prairie View was always a stepchild of A&M and all of its funding had to come through the regions at A&M. During its early years, the college was led by a brave group of men and women who shared a commitment and vision to build a school to educate African Americans. E.H. Anderson became the second principal of Prairie View and served for 12 years. His brother, L.C. Anderson, was appointed as the third principal of the school. And under his administration, the enrollment grew to 60 students. During this time, Anderson appealed directly to the state legislature for help for the college. When Mr. Anderson was principal, they did not give him any money one year. They said they didn't have any money. And he got on his horse, and he came to Austin, and he pleaded with the legislature if they would please give him some money, not money for clothes, not money for food or housing, but for his students to have books. They had been receiving old books from A&M, but he was pleading with the legislature to at least give him some money for books. When he got back to Prairie View, they had put his things out on the highway. Meanwhile in Austin, the Texas legislature was embroiled in controversy on where to locate the newly established University of Texas. UT was founded in Austin because of a legislative action. They had had a vote, and the vote put the university in Galveston because it was the most populous county. And the legislature overruled it because they wanted it to be here in the capital city. By the late 1800s, while white Texans had the freedom to attend Texas A&M or the University of Texas or church schools such as Baylor, Southwestern or Austin College, Prairie View was the only public school open to black Texans. Attending college was indeed a dream in a state where very few people even finished grammar school. In 1897, in an effort to expose Prairie View students to successful black role models, Principal E.L. Blackshear invited the influential educator and black leader, Booker T. Washington, to be the commencement day speaker. Washington had been born into slavery and enjoyed much success as the president of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Principal Blackshear also introduced intercollegiate athletics, and Prairie View played its first football game in 1907, defeating Wiley College 7 to nothing. The early principals at Prairie View A&M maintained strict rules on the campus. Principals at that time uh, had almost total control over the students' daily uh, activities. They kept the, the campus separated, men on one side, women on the other side. They made sure that the students went to what they call Vespers, uh, where they would have daily prayers, uh, the daily gatherings where they would go to church. They were taught uh, how to handle themselves in social settings. The university set up events to teach the students how you should dress and how you should act. In 1901, Texas entered a dynamic new era, when on January 10th, just south of Beaumont, the spindle top claim brought the booming oil industry to the formerly agrarian culture. Even though Texas was now enjoying the big oil boom, times continued to be tough for Prairie View. Every time the institution looked up, it was facing, you know, a storm or an enrollment problem or a natural disaster or no money, not enough money for whatever. But there were some people back there who amazingly well-qualified, many of them came from some of the finest schools, found their way to this place. The beginning of the new century brought change on the national level as well. In 1909, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, or NAACP, was founded to promote the use of the courts to restore the legal rights of black Americans. Prairie View began to offer baccalaureate degrees and by 1916 had graduated over 1,500 students. In 1917, World War I broke out in Europe, and by October, the first American troops had arrived in France to join the fight. More than 350,000 African Americans served in segregated units during the war. At the end of the war, the first recognized Reserve Officers Training Corps ROTC came to the Prairie View campus. 
The Cooperative Extension Service was also launched at this time. After World War I, there was a great need for school teachers in Texas, and Prairie View soon became the major source of teachers for the segregated black public schools. Now, Prairie View, for the first part of its origin, was a norm, what we call a normal school. We had normal schools throughout this country. They, they gave them two years of, of undergraduate education, then they put them out in the field. Uh, this went on, oh, until the early 20s at Prairie View. Uh, they were great creative, creative teachers, great creators of vocational teachers, great creators of agriculture, home economics, and what, what have you, uh, in those particular uh, years. Black communities across Texas faced a severe shortage of doctors and nurses. And Principal J.G. Osborne, believing strongly that African-American women should be given the opportunity to enter the medical profession, started Prairie View School of Nursing in 1917. You know, Pearl Review's nursing program is the uh, oldest nursing school west of the Mississippi, in the, and the oldest nursing school that enrolled uh, African-American students in Texas. W.R. Banks next served as principal for Prairie View from 1925 to 1946. During this time, the college continued to expand and to attract more students. Principal Banks instituted many progressive ideas and led a notable struggle for equality in education and social justice for blacks in Texas. They had a program that every student who graduated from Prairie View must complete six hours of what he called industry. And that means whether you were in liberal arts or music or, or you name it, you had to learn something by which you could do something vocationally. During this time, Prairie View's academic reputation grew, and it began to be known as the Center for Learning and Community Outreach for Blacks in Texas. The school touched the lives of countless farmers and homemakers in rural communities through the Agricultural Extension Service. Thousands of black farmers attended sessions at Prairie View to learn how to better operate their farms. Most of your teachers that taught uh, in the historically black schools then came out of the teacher education program here at Prairie View. Uh, in addition to the teachers, uh, the nursing piece came out of Prairie View. So you had a lot of your nursing program, uh, or nurses here in the state, uh, came from this program. While the school was making a name for itself and making great strides in the education of its students, blacks were still viewed by many to be second-class citizens. During his 20 years as principal, W.R. Banks, a man of strong intellect and background, was never afforded the opportunity to meet with the Board of Regents of Texas A&M. The legacy of inequality for blacks had yet to be changed, and it was not to change for many years. One might ask, what, what was the opportunity for black students to get a higher education, university education in Texas? If they didn't go to a private school, prior to 1947, the only public institution that they could go to in this state was Prairie View. Throughout its history, Prairie View faced a continuous struggle for funding and recognition. Since black students were not allowed to attend other public colleges in Texas, the state legislature declared that Prairie View should receive equal funding in proportion to the white colleges. However, Prairie View rarely received this equal funding. As a result, the campus facilities and grounds were in bad shape. It was horrible. The first time I went on that campus, I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, as I said, it was muddy. There were no sidewalks. It wasn't like uh, the University of Texas in terms of the polished, manicured lawns and the in incredible landscaping. Prairie View did not have the sidewalks. It did not have the facilities. And it was just appalling. But students, the spirit was high. The interest and the energy expended on the campus got you excited about the potential and what was going on. And it was never perceived in my mind as something that we could abandon or something that wouldn't be worth the effort that it would take to bring it up to par. In 1941, nearly 40% of all black students in Texas attended Prairie View. Prairie View graduates were becoming community leaders across the state, prompting Texas Governor Leo Daniel to visit the campus. I'm a product of Prairie View A&M University. Um, 
I got a master's degree in secondary education uh, with emphasis with emphasis on secondary education. I wanted to teach exceptional children, and at that particular time, Purview was one of the few schools within the state of Texas that offered that program. It was offered at the University of Houston, but because I was black, I was not allowed to go to that school. At the time, other black students attended private or church schools or were actually paid by the state of Texas to go out of state to receive an education. What Texas also had as a provision was that any student, African-American student, who wanted to go into a field where the degree was awarded UT but not awarded at Prairie View, the state would pay for them to take that curriculum someplace else. We lost some of the brightest and best minds that could have been an asset to this state because we would not let them develop uh, academically or intellectually in Texas. It's our loss. The administration of Prairie View struggled for funding just to maintain the campus facilities. New facilities and other campus amenities were only a dream. The campus was small and uh, more or less agriculturally oriented. They had uh, little houses where the faculty lived around the perimeter of the university. And I lived in one, the president lived on the other corner. In 1941, America found itself again fighting in a war overseas. During World War II, Prairie View made many contributions to the war effort. Since most male students were in the armed forces, an all-girl band, the Prairie View co-eds, traveled across the U.S. performing at black military bases, theaters, and other universities. Their success enabled them to perform at New York's famed Apollo Theater in Harlem, where they presented four shows a day. But walking out there, you know, my knees were kind of knocking because New York, the Apollo Theater, that was the epitome, you know? When traveling across the segregated South, the Prairie View co ed stayed at black owned hotels and ate at black owned restaurants. If there were no restaurants serving blacks, these young college students had to eat at the back door of white owned restaurants. Riding up in three station wagons, all college-educated women and somebody who was of white skin takes a straw out of his mouth and spits and says, we don't serve no niggas here. We had to keep going just to use the restroom. That's mistreatment. And it was a lack of respect, and it's a day which I hope none of the other people of my race ever have to know. But nevertheless, uh, we were above that, and we rose above it. Because of their contributions to inspiring the country's morale during the war, the co-eds were recently honored on the campus. When the country was at war, a senior ROTC unit was established on the Prairie View campus. In 1945, the school was renamed Prairie View University. The school was authorized to offer all courses taught at the University of Texas in Austin as the need arose. During this time, Texas and the South remained segregated. Even the Prairie View campus maintained segregated facilities. When the all-white Texas A&M Board of Regents would occasionally visit Prairie View, they would dine in a whites-only dining room on the second floor of Hilliard Hall. Dr. E.B. Evans, who was appointed principal of Prairie View in 1947, was not allowed to enter the whites-only dining room and spoke with the visiting regents through an intercom. Dr. Evans, who was then the principal of Prairie View, couldn't go in the room uh, because it was so white, so they, they built an intercom and, and, and put it out in the hall. So the first intercom on the campus was over in our main, was in the dining hall at that time, Hilliard Hall, so that the board could talk to Dr. Evans out in the hall. When Dr. Evans started going to college station, he couldn't attend the boardroom. When it came 12 o'clock, we went across to what's called the colored section of town and got lunch. When Evans would come down to a meeting in Houston at the Rice Hotel, he would have to use the freight elevator to go upstairs to the meeting. He couldn't go to the front door. University president. In 1948, 70 years into its existence, the Texas A&M Board of Regents officially agreed to allow Prairie View to have a president, and Principal E.B. Evans became President Evans. Because the stores and restaurants in nearby Hempstead were segregated and would not serve blacks, the university became almost a town within itself. Eventually, Dr. Evans convinced the Hempstead merchants to integrate and accept Prairie View students as customers. 
Prairie View now boasted an annual enrollment of more than 2,100 students with 245 faculty members. Recognizing the need to train and build a workforce of skilled engineers, Prairie View established the School of Engineering in 1950. It would soon become the major source of black engineers in Texas. By the 1970s, the School of Engineering had trained more black engineers than any other college in the U.S. For years, Prairie View sought academic accreditation comparable to white universities. The school finally received its accreditation when it was accepted for membership and the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools in 1958. Dr. Alvin I. Thomas was elected president in 1966 and served until 1982. Dr. Thomas's contributions during his tenure were substantial, including the establishment of the first Naval Reserve Officer Training Program at an HBCU. During the 1960s and early 70s, the issue of civil rights gripped the nation as blacks demanded equality. Student protests relating to the Vietnam War and civil rights issues occurred on college campuses across the country. The Prairie View campus was also affected by the unrest as students rallied in support of civil rights issues nationwide. In 1971, 1,500 Prairie View students staged a protest in front of Dr. Thomas's home demanding more student freedoms. Dr. Thomas closed the school down for a few days and sent all the students home. In good times and bad, Prairie View always had excellent support from the African American community. Black families from all over the state sent their sons and daughters to the school to be educated. However, many former students recall the campus as being isolated and provincial. The rules were very strict. Uh, you had to be in the dormitory by a certain time, and you had to sign in. You had to sign in, sign out, and your senior fellows made sure that you were studying uh, in your room. Had to go to church on Sundays, you know, those things that you had to do. We still had uh, dorm mothers, and freshman students could not be out after 6 o'clock in the afternoons. So we had to be in our rooms and signed in. That was room check. The girls were kept on one side of the campus and the boys kept on the other side. For example, in agriculture, we did not have any uh, females majoring in ag because they couldn't come on this side of the campus. There was a chapel exercise that was compulsory on Sundays. There was one that was volunteered through the week, but students did attend. A movie was on the campus that was the rec main recreation. In 1973, the state legislature again changed the name of the school to Prairie View A&M University. It was still part of the Texas A&M system, but not sharing equally in state funding. The Black Caucus in the state legislature began to question this. State Representative Symphronia Thompson was part of the group looking into the funding issue. In 1974, Wilhelmina Delco was elected to the state legislature. She soon became chairman of the Committee on Higher Education, which had oversight of public colleges. This would prove to be a great advantage for Prairie View. It was very difficult to get the Prairie View agenda at the top of the legislative agenda for the Committee on Higher Education. There were people who didn't even realize that, that it was a problem, did not even know of how Prairie View stood in relation to other institutions. We got it at the top of the agenda and we had the unqualified unanimous support of the members of the caucus and a lot of other members of the house. The support just was there. One source of irritation to the Black Caucus was the Permanent University Fund. This fund, called the Puff, was established in 1840 when Texas was still a republic. The Texas Congress set aside a large amount of land in West Texas to pay for higher education in Texas. Years later, when oil was discovered on the land, the value of the puff soared, exceeding all expectations. But it was not without controversy. In 1931, the legislature split the fund. Two-thirds of the income would go to the University of Texas and one-third to Texas A&M, since these were recognized as the two flagship state colleges. Prairie View held the position that they should share in these funds since they actually began operation before the University of Texas was even founded and since they were part of Texas A&M. 
but without a voice in the legislature, Prairie View's request for equal funding went unanswered. So African Americans were not allowed to attend Texas A&M or UT, and the one school they could attend, Prairie View, did not share in the income from the permanent university fund. Ms. Wilhelmina Delco put these petitions on the floor of, of the House of Representatives, and they were able to, to pass a measure to have a ballot initiative to recognize Prairie View as one of those three institutions in the Constitution of the first class. And that then, too, would allow us to share in the permanent university fund money. When the permanent university fund was established, the assumption was that Prairie View got an appropriation from that fund initially, and it did initially. But then when the voters chose to put a medical school at Galveston, the legislature did not appropriate enough money to fund the development of that medical school. And the legislature just ignored the fact that the comptroller took the available money that should have been divided between UT and A&M and Prairie View and took the Prairie View portion of that money and sent it to the medical school fund in Galveston. In the early 1980s, a bill was introduced in the state legislature that would eliminate Prairie View and Texas Southern. The property would be sold and the students transferred to other state colleges. This threat mobilized the Black Caucus to work even harder for equal funding for the black colleges. In 1984, with pressure from the Black Caucus, an amendment was added to the Texas Constitution that enabled Prairie View A&M to join the University of Texas at Austin and Texas A&M University as the state's only constitutionally designated institutions of the first class. This entitled Prairie View to share in the puff. For the first time in the 106-year history of the university, the state of Texas agreed that Prairie View was on the same level as Texas A&M and the University of Texas. Finally, the winds of change swept through Prairie View. After years of struggling, the school saw a strong increase in its funding and recognition. With the additional funding, its campus facilities and academic programs became more competitive with other Texas colleges. The Board of Regents of the Texas A&M University System expressed its intention that Prairie View A&M become an institution nationally recognized in its areas of education and research. Though not a military school, members of Prairie View's administration often came from military backgrounds, such as Dr. Percy A. Pierre, who served in the Department of Defense. He was appointed fourth president of the university in 1983. Dr. Pierre sought to improve the school's academic standing and established an honors program to attract more professors with PhDs to the campus. With the additional funds that came from the state, Dr. Pierre developed a master plan for the campus and built a new library. He even considered expanding Prairie View with a branch in Fort Worth, but these plans never came through. In 1989, the school announced that for the first time, an alumnus, Lieutenant General Julius W. Becton, Jr., would become university president. President Becton was the first graduate of the university to attain star rank in the military. Dr. Charles A. Hines was named as the sixth president of the university in November of 1994. A graduate of Howard University and a retired major general in the U.S. Army, Dr. Hines brought a new vision and direction to Prairie View. At the same time, he reconfirmed the school's mission. The mission of the university is a land-grant university. It's the teaching, research, and service. And uh, that embodies everything that we do. If, if you wanted to break that down into a, in a, into a very basic statement, it's to provide an education to all who seek it. During his administration, undergraduate enrollment grew by 20%. The university endowment increased by over 500%, and the university created more than 20 new academic programs. We have, I think, four or five very, very outstanding academic areas that, that can uh, rival any program anywhere in the country. Uh, biology, uh, that produces uh, uh, medical doctors and dentists. Architecture, uh, that, uh, that wins in competitions against the major universities, against Rice, Texas A&M, UT.
The country school that started out teaching broom making now offers Ph.D. programs in electrical engineering, juvenile justice, and educational leadership. Prairie View graduates are working with NASA and designing nuclear submarines for the U.S. Navy. Prairie View now offers virtually every field of study. One group of enterprising engineering students built an award-winning solar-powered car. The university has made a greater contribution to the general society in that we have educated large numbers of folks in the humanities, in the social sciences, and particularly in engineering, computer science, business, those areas. And our students are everywhere. Prairie View also qualifies for federal grants and research funding. We have a number of research projects going on at Prairie View. Uh, among those that really stand out are those that are funded by agencies such as uh, NASA, uh, those funded by the Air Force. The NASA project, the, the primary one, the main one, is one where we work with them on radiation effects on materials and people as we try to explore outer space. As it is at most colleges, Prairie View students participate in many on-campus activities and student organizations, including national sororities, fraternities, honor societies, religious groups, the forensic team, and choir. In September of 2002, the Prairie View Concert Chorale was honored to represent the United States in one of Europe's most prestigious music festivals, the international music festival, Ratislavia Cantans. The Prairie View Concert Chorale was the only choir from the United States that participated in the festival. We were asked to go to Poland as a result of a performance we did with Houston Symphony Orchestra back in March of 2001. They delighted audiences by performing a wide range of music from the Star Spangled Banner and Porgy and Bess to Handel's Messiah. quite an honor to be invited to go, and the actual experience was unforgettable. Many success stories have come out of the school's highly regarded ROTC programs. And I think the ROTC program was one of the best things that we had. We, as, as uh, black kids, African-American kids back in that day, that, that was a great opportunity to really uh, get a chance to move into another sector of our society that a lot of people didn't get. And I think that's important so we can really be well-rounded uh, as we move about. Even though the school's buildings and faces may have changed, the very soul of Prairie View remains constant. A sense of heritage and working towards social change still permeates the campus. As an example, the theater department is working to change the image of minorities in film and theater. We must change the image of the minority in television, film, and on stage. We can do this through the arts, through theater, and that is my goal. I think that the theater can change an image because if we see different kinds of minorities, different kind of families who are minorities, we can get a different perspective of who minorities really are. The School of Architecture is taking a leadership role in rebuilding America's inner cities. Currently, only 1% of America's registered architects are African American. Prairie View is working to change that. We have added uh, construction science and we have added also a master of community development and we transformed, just finished transforming the Bachelor of Architecture, which is five years, to a Master of Architecture as a professional degree. The College of Nursing, as it has since its founding, works to promote and maintain the health of underserved populations. We graduate more minority students than any other nursing program. And so if you look at a history of almost 80 years of graduating nursing students, I think the number of students that we produce that uh, have made a major contribution to nursing in Texas is quite large. The university also recognized the need to train students in research science and opened the first solar observatory in the state of Texas in the summer of 1998. We will produce the architects who will rebuild America's brownfields and rust belts. We'll produce the doctors that will cure, the nurses that will care, the engineers that will build. 
Colleges and universities in the South are often defined by their sports programs. And Prairie View, in addition to its academic achievements, was always well known for athletics. From the early 1900s to the 1970s, its football and basketball programs celebrated championship after championship and produced many athletes who went on to play professional ball. But when the previously all-white colleges began admitting black athletes, Prairie View saw a decline in its once proud athletic program. A perennial rival uh, was always Wiley College, uh, uh, Texas College. And when Texas Southern uh, started to grow up, they became a great rival. When I was a student here then, one of the things of pride was that we won everything, basketball, football, you name it, uh, we, we had a powerhouse. They called it the Notre Dame of black college football. Any sporting event down at Prairie View was a big thing. We only had the, uh, the stadium with the one side of the field that had the real large bleacher on, another side had a small uh, stand. It was packed. I remember doing a swag tour, Coach Eddie Robinson from Gramlin said that when he first started coaching at Gramlin, he used to fear coming to Prairie View because he would get beat up. You had guys that would just knock him out. Uh, so Eddie Robinson didn't even like bringing his teams out to Prairie View. <laughs> One of the most visual elements of the university, and a point of great pride, is the Prairie View A&M Marching Storm, the school band. When you hear those drums in that box section coming down the street or even over there just practicing, you know something good is going to happen. You know, or at a halftime celebration, nothing like halftime. I mean, the crowd waits for a halftime show here with the University Marching Storm. Um, and then, of course, you've got the majorettes. Um, referred to as the black boxes um, and they are the um, elite dance troupe if you will um, that accompanies the band as their major rest. In 1999 soon to be president George W. Bush visited the campus and was so impressed with the band that he later invited them to Washington to participate in his inaugural celebration. Even though athletics are rebounding at Prairie View, tragedy struck the men's track team in February of 2000. While traveling to a track meet in East Texas, four athletes were killed when their van crashed on a rural highway. Deep emotions uh, arise when we talk about that incident because it, it, really, it really struck chords with us as, as a university family. The, the sense of loss was, it was almost like a complete blanket of darkness fell over the campus. Gradually, Prairie View is being seen as a great value to the state of Texas. The current annual enrollment exceeds 6,600, including 1,000 graduate students. More than 4,500 academic degrees have been awarded in the last five years, including over 1,500 graduate degrees. The university now receives admission applications from prospective students from all over the world. And America's largest businesses seek to hire Prairie View graduates. When I came to Prairie View, my uh, main interest was to teach uh, and to teach uh, young people. And, uh, and something that really makes you feel good is when you can see a student that you taught that's now a vice president, president, uh, uh, in some position at a, at a, at a, at a company. We have a number of uh, many talented students I've, in music uh, in my department who have uh, gone on to uh, greater heights. Uh, they've graduated and they're taking positions as band directors, choir directors in Texas and other states. We've had several graduates to go on to um, professional performing careers, some as sing concert singers and those performing in operas. And this day, with all public colleges in Texas fully integrated, it begs the question, why maintain historically black colleges and universities when a diverse student population is highly sought after by most institutions of higher learning?
Why do you need a Prairie View when qualified African-American students can go to A&M? Why do you need a Texas Southern when qualified African-American students can go across the street to the University of Houston or come to Austin? The reality is that if you're talking about why do we need, do we in fact in this state want to make a University of Texas, a Texas A&M, and everything else branches of them? No. We want to allow the diversity that is reflective of this state. Their role today is essentially the role uh, that they had when they were created, and that is to provide opportunity and access and an education to those who might otherwise be left behind. Individuals like myself who never went to all black schools or was always the minority, you know, but to go to a school where you're not always the minority, I think it was really good. There is a place for historically black colleges. It's a blessing to have those that are state supported because most of the institutions have to strive on their own for every nickel and dime. The smaller academic setting is very important to students. And I would submit that the historically black colleges have probably nurtured that concept because they took students who were not only first generation, but some of them had never even been exposed to a collegiate environment. And they've taken those students where they are, built on their ambition to succeed, and magnified their assets and minimized their, the negatives and really turn them into outstanding students. And I would argue that they turn out some of the best students in terms of college graduates and professional people in this country. Today, Prairie View A&M maintains a strict equal opportunity environment and is open to all students regardless of race or color. Prairie View continues to be a focal point for African Americans in the state. The Texas Institute for Preservation of History and Culture will soon open on the campus. It will be a center where scholars and, uh, and young people and school kids can come to see that uh, the African American had a role to play in the greatness that's Texas. While African American students currently constitute 89% of Prairie View's total enrollment, in a testament to the school's evolution, 22% of the graduate enrollment is now comprised of white students. As part of Prairie View's heritage, the long-standing College of Agriculture and Human Sciences still serves to reinforce the basic land-grant function upon which the university was founded. If there's a lesson to be learned from Prairie View A&M's exhilarating story of survival, it's the perseverance of the human spirit. Against all odds and over the long haul, a great institution prevails due to the vision of its leadership and the daily tending by generations of individuals who nurture it. I think there's been a transformation in all young people who come to Prairie View. Uh, uh, many of them come from uh, different environments. Uh, uh, we, most of our students are from uh, Texas uh, cities. Uh, and I think as a result of the atmosphere at Prairie View, the uh, occasions for dreaming what one can do in life in terms of careers, I think that they leave here uh, as better people. Prairie View is very special because it serves um, an historically bypassed uh, community of students. The rich history of this institution, the fact that it has survived unbelievable obstacles and has really, really grown to become a first-class kind of place, I think is a testimony that you don't want to forget. You can't help but to learn something about, a, about yourself attending a school that has so much history in it. When you learn your history, you learn about yourself. I feel honored to be here because I know that the people who were once here couldn't have this position in life and they worked hard to get me here. And I, I'm really honored to be here and I thank them so much. Prairie View symbolizes to me more than overcoming. It symbolizes challenge. It symbolizes choice. It symbolizes cooperation and has stood at that, uh, as that symbol through good times and bad, through support and opposition through uh, criticism and applause. And please God, it will always be there.
the once small college for colored youths on the Texas prairie that struggle for funding, recognition, and equality not only has survived, it has gained a reputation across the U.S. and worldwide. Today, Prairie View's buildings and trees sit in quiet dignity guarding the heritage of those who built the college. When walking across the campus, students can almost hear the echoes of the brave men and women who transformed a slave plantation into a university. Prairie View A&M does indeed sit on hallowed ground, and there is a lot to celebrate. 125 years as part of the rich cultural tapestry that is Texas. And Prairie View won the homecoming game 35 to 16. Thank you. 